So this morning I want to talk about Jacob and the perspective of the three-tiered universe and ziggurats and ladders and stairways and grace and what all of this has to do with transitions. But first, Jacob, <clears throat> the same Jacob we talked about last week, the same Jacob who was on the run. Remember, he stole his brothers, his older brother Esau, he stole his blessing. Esau was so furious, he wanted to kill Jacob for this. So Jacob is on the run, going to a new land. And last week, we met Jacob on the shores of the, uh, the Jabbok River, and he was in this big wrestling match with God, and he finds this new identity, called into new things. So now, today, we're backing up a few chapters. Jacob is on the run, but this is the beginning of his run, and he had another encounter with God, a different experience, and it's one of the most fascinating stories we have in Scripture. I'm in 28. Last week, we were in Genesis 32. Here's how the story goes. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. He reached a certain place and spent the night there. When the sun had set, he took one of the stones at that place and put it near his head. Then he lay down there. He dreamed and saw a raised staircase, its foundation on earth and its top touching the sky. And God's messengers were ascending and descending on it. Suddenly, the Lord was standing on it saying, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will become like the dust of the earth. You will spread out to the west, east, north, and south. Every family of earth will be blessed because of you and your descendants. I am with you now. I will protect you everywhere you go. And I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I've done everything that I've promised you. When Jacob woke from his sleep, he thought to himself, The Lord is definitely in this place, but I didn't know it. He was terrified and thought, This sacred place is awesome. It's none other than God's house and the entrance to heaven. After Jacob got up early in the morning, he took the stone that he had put near his head, set it up as a sacred pillar, and poured oil on top of it. He named that sacred place Bethel. <clears throat> so some of you may remember a couple of months ago, we talked about the problem of the three-tiered universe. Meaning, God is up here somewhere. Humans are down here somewhere in the middle. And bad, dark, ominous things are down below. And when we operate in a religious sense in a three-tiered universe, humans are always trying to see who can be the best manipulators of God. Who can manipulate God the most to get God to come down and give blessings? Now, if you're a bit of a bad boy, you've been on the bad track, the wrong path, then it's about who can manipulate God the most, who can give the most, sacrifice the most, offer the most to get God to stay up there so God isn't on our backs. <clears throat> and for so many people, when it comes to the modern church project, they've said no. I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm not going to play that game anymore. I'm out of here. Who wants that kind of God? And you can understand this, right? But what this story says, what makes this story so cool, what makes this story so ahead of its time, is this story says, God has been here the whole time, and you, Jacob, are just now waking up to this reality. This story is doing a brand new thing. God didn't just show up. You showed up. You woke up. You became present. God has been present all along. And we still see residue, right, from, from this three-tiered system, this three-tiered universe. And we hear that language of God just showing up. Oh, I was in some sort of predicament or dilemma, and, and God just showed up and rescued or I was driving through the King Supers parking lot and it was crowded on this day and, and I was in a hurry because I had a meeting to get to and it was strange because when I pulled in, God just showed up and she was pulling out and I got that front row space. God showed up. But the problem with God just showing up is if God just shows up in King Supers parking lots, well then where was God before that? And where is God after that? 
And if God is just showing up in King Super's parking lots, then why won't God just show up in Syria or Iraq? Why won't God just show up in some of our neighborhoods and streets and towns and families where there's real suffering? So we can see the problem with this, right? Which leads me to ziggurats. You have to say this word with me because it's just all kinds of fun to say. You'll be saying it all morning. Ziggurat. Oh, come on, put some oomph into it. Ziggurat. All right, the ziggurat. Here's what the ziggurat is. This is fascinating. The ziggurat is this ancient temple-like structures built by Assyrians and Babylonians. We can find these all in the uh, Mesopotamian era. And all ziggurats were built similarly, and they functioned in the same way. Ziggurats, this is the place where the local religious people would go to make sacrifices and offerings to their gods. Every ziggurat had a ramp or a stairway coming out of the front. Some ziggurats were bigger than others, and so if they had multiple layers, they would all be connected by these ramps or stairways. You'd go up to give offerings or sacrifices to get the blessings of the gods. Here's what they say about these ramps, these stairways. These were the connectors. They were the connecting link between heaven and earth. This is the place where the people went to encounter their gods. So the story that we hear in Genesis of Jacob's dream, it is a completely natural story, completely familiar to Jacob and his people and the ancient hearers of this story. Oh, of course. Of course, Jacob is dreaming of the ziggurat. And then we hear in the story that there were people, God's messengers, ascending and descending on it. Of course. Next slide, please. Of course. There's people ascending and descending on it all the time, all day long, going up, making sacrifices, and coming back down. Of course, this is normal. Jacob is dreaming of the ziggurat in the stairway. But then the story takes this radical shift in verse 13. And it starts with this word, suddenly. And when you see the word suddenly in scriptures, be aware something new is happen, happening. Suddenly, Jacob sees God standing on top. And this God starts to talk to Jacob. This God says, Jacob, I'm the Lord your God. I'm the God of Abraham and Isaac. And I have been with you on this whole journey. And I am with you now. And when you leave this place, and when you start to run some more, I'm going to be there with you too. And when you make mistakes, I'm going to be there with you too. And when you need grace, I'm going to be there with you too. Now, this is the point in the story when the first hearers of this story, they would have been shaking their heads. Uh-uh. Uh-uh, Jacob. That's not the way the gods work. That's not the way the system works. You can't have that kind of access to the gods. And can you imagine Jacob responding, Oh, yeah, but this God, Yahweh, came to me. Uh-uh, Jacob. That's not the way it works. It's not the way the system works. You must have made some sort of great sacrifice or great offering to have this kind of access. And can you imagine Jacob responding? Mm -mm. I, I didn't even go up the ziggurat. I was actually running from God. I was actually opposed to God. I was running from the one God created. And this God came to me. Do you see how this story is doing a brand new thing? Do you see how the three-tiered structure of the universe actually works here? The, story, the storyteller starts with it. How does he start? With the stairway coming down from the heavens. How does the story end? With Jacob saying, wait a minute. God is definitely in this place. God is here. I just didn't know it. I wasn't aware of it. But God is here. It's not about going up to the ziggurat. It's not about meeting God on the stairway. 
It's about seeing the divine presence in all of life. In all of it. And we have some of the same questions, right? I mean, sometimes we step into church buildings and we say, oh, this space is sacred and holy. Or we walk into sanctuaries and we say, this space is sacred and holy. Of course it is. But when you walk out to the parking lot, is it too sacred and holy? And when you're going home and you share a meal with family or friends, is it too sacred and holy? And when you go to your son's t-ball game, is it sacred and holy? And when you're hanging out with your grandkids, is it sacred and holy? And when you're holding your baby in the middle of the night at 3 o'clock in the morning because he won't stop crying, there's still a debate around that. Sometimes it's sacred and holy. <laughs> but can you imagine? Jacob would say, yes, of course it is. Don't miss it. I missed it, but now I see. And it's all sacred and holy, all of it. Seeing God in all parts of the journey. Jacob is journeying from point to point. He's in transition. And this thing happens in this place. What does Jacob do? He stops. He pauses. He names it. This isn't just the wilderness. This isn't just somewhere in the middle of nowhere. Something is happening here. God is in this place, so I'll name this place Bethel, God's house. Why? Because it's all God's house. It's all sacred and holy. The stone, the stairway, the ground, all of it, it's all sacred and holy. This story says you don't have to go up the ziggurat to encounter God. This story is a story about transition. I used to see it this way, but now I see it this way. There was a time when I wasn't aware, but now I am aware. Now I see, and when you see, you know this to be true, you can't unsee. The ladder, the stairway, these are means of grace. These are moments of grace. Where have you in your life experienced ladders and stairways? Where have you in your life had those Bethel moments where you say, God is in this place. God is here, but I, I just wasn't aware of it. And it's often in looking back in your journey. And see, the temptation is when you begin to see God and yourself and the world in new ways, the temptation is to start beating yourself up a little bit. Oh my gosh, how did I miss that one? How could I not have seen that? How did I miss that? I mean, I can remember d different moments in college when I was coming out of a more fundamentalist Christian faith and growing into something new and different. And there was moments where I thought, oh my goodness, how did I miss that? How could I not have seen that? Ryan, how did you actually think that God only loved people exactly like you? How did you actually think that God's grace only extended to people in your religious tribe? And you know what I'm learning? That is not a good question. That's a boring question. It's water under the bridge. I used to see it this way, but now I see it this way. Because I was working out of the categories that were available to me, but now I see it this way. And when you read through the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, there is story after story of character after character, community after community, who they're waking up to the, to the divine presence that's all around them. And there's never a sense of embarrassment or shame or guilt or why couldn't I see it before. It is always, hey, Let's get some rocks and build, build a pillar. Let's make this sacred. Let's remember this. Let's celebrate this. If that describes you and your experience this morning, if you've had that kind of experience, I invite you after the sermon, during the song that plays, I invite you to come to one of our stations. There's two in the front and one in the back. And there's just simple rocks and oil. And I invite you to just like Jacob, Pour a couple of drops of oil on the rocks. Remember these moments of grace because that's what it is. It's grace. And when we encounter grace, 
We respond in gratitude. Or maybe your experience is different. Maybe you're one of the ones that says, yeah, I used to see it this way. I used to think this thing over here was sacred and this stuff over here didn't matter as much. Like I used to think just chasing after the money was the sacred thing. I used to think climbing up the ladder of my career or my job, that was the thing. But now I'm actually seeing that these things over here matter. That these relationships with friends and family, these things matter. The things that I give myself to in the community, these things matter and they too are holy and sacred. If you have had that sort of experience, name it, remember it. Pour some oil on the rocks, just like Jacob. God is in this place. Or maybe your experience is still yet different. Maybe you feel a bit like Jacob. You're on the run. You're in some sort of major life transition. And it feels like you're wandering. And it's not that you're opposed to God or you're against God. But it's just that when it comes to all this God stuff, you have all sorts of questions. All sorts of questions. And you don't know when it comes to this transition, you don't know where it's going to put you. You don't know where you're going to end up. You don't know the outcome. And maybe the best kind of dream for you would be Jacob's kind of dream. Where you actually saw the stairway coming down. Where you actually saw God standing on top of the ziggurat. And God was waving God's arms, saying to you, I'm here, I'm here, and I've been here all along, and I'm with you now. And when you leave this place, when you take the next step in the transition, I will be there with you too. And when you make mistakes, I'll be there with you too. And when you need grace, I'll be there with you too, because I am in all of it. The other day, on Thursday, I was looking for an email, an old email, and I, I typed in a keyword. And that brought up a host of emails. One was from 2007. It wasn't the email I was looking for, but I clicked on it. And when I clicked on it, there was this attachment. It was an attachment of a poem that I wrote back in 2007. In 2007, I was in seminary, and I was taking this class called Ancient Hebrew Poetry. And my professor at the time invited me to write a poem on grief. I was five years out of my brother Brandon's death. And it was the scariest poem I ever wrote. And it was like pouring water, or I'm sorry, pouring oil on the rocks. And I started writing this poem, and it took a few weeks. And when I started, it, it was accusations. God, you have left us. You're not here. And what's worse than that, God, is you don't even care. You knew about this and you didn't care. God, you told us to come to the ravine. You told us to come to the wadi. But when we got there, it was dry and there was no water. Why? And then the poem transitions a little bit. God, is there another way to think about this? Is there another way to look at this? Did you really forsake us? And then I get to the end of the poem. And I was invited to read this poem in the class. And again, my voice was shaking. My hands were sweating. I was trembling with fear. And it was one of those moments that it was like naming it. It was pouring the oil on the rocks. And here's how the poem ended. It was the first time I had ever proclaimed out loud and to myself and to others that new life is actually possible and I actually believed it. I actually believed it. Lions and serpents still encircle us, but you have protected us. We still cry, but these tears are our food and we rest in the evening, sharing the memories of his life, telling the stories, retelling the stories. Life is different. It will never be the way it used to be. This is grief. But this hurt is not incurable. Life can be made new, different, but new. The wound is deep, but healing is possible as we reimagine what life with him and life with God is all about. My God, my God, God has not forsaken us. Those are moments of grace. Remembering those moments. 
marking those moments, pouring oil on the rocks just like Jacob. If your experience is one of being in the midst of transition, in the midst of new life, I invite you to come to the stations. Pour some oil. If you're yearning, craving new life, mark it, name it, because that too is sacred. So during this song, by the way, it's Led Zeppelin, because how can you talk about stairways coming from heaven all morning and not play a little Led Zeppelin? During the song, I invite you to move to one of the stations. And as always, anytime we have stations, you're free to just remain seated and reflect. Amen.